rumors spread around. United takes his town. Hey, we're back. The Mikey Man and Randy Show. I'm Randy Man. I, I'm I'm uh, formerly uh, Mikey Man. I'm now uh, Sanjaya. <laughs> Sanjaya <laughs> McClanahan here. Sanjaya. <laughs> That's, and why am I changing my name, you yeah, ask? Why, why, why? <laughs> Tell me, Sanjaya. Why are you changing your name, Ooh. Sanjaya? Uh, this is for the American Idol people. But I, I'm changing my name to Sanjaya because... Uh, to, to reflect the fact that I have no talent, but you keep asking me to come back week after week, <laughs> just like they do Sanjaya. You know I told Don, I told Don, it was time to get rid of you weeks ago, but the audience keeps yeah, asking keep, you back. Keep getting voted back on. That's right. The, the students keep asking for you, so we, we, we've had you back. It's called the Sanjaya effect in the literature now. I love it. I love it. Well, we are here today at uh, a nursing home here in Auburn called Monarch Estates. There it is. Gracious Retirement Living to talk about life care planning. Right. And why are we here to talk about life care planning, you say? Because in life care plans, many times, uh, 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 a retirement home can be one of the viable options for a person. I mean, it's possible. It's possible that you could build a retirement home in for a life care plan. That's right. Nah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think we should go somewhere where, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, life is represented a little differently, don't you? I'm for it. Let's try it. See ya. All right. We're this going. actually, yeah, this Woo-hoo. actually, hey, hey, this looks more like living to me. Well, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. See that? See that? We're here at, uh, we're here at Tuaxa Park. One of uh, what Mike calls one of the, our Auburn treasures. It is. Uh, when when you're young and feisty, a lot of people <laughs> come climb around these rocks and hang out and swim in the pool below. What are we doing here? <laughs> yeah, no, we're looking for the young and feisty, but uh, it's a little bit uh, cool and breezy. Maybe. If we stay here long enough, they'll show up. They'll be here. Yeah. They'll be here. Yeah. So we may, you know, we may add scenery as we go along. Talking about life care planning. The, yeah, uh, this is not scenery. That, that no. Is, no, 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 no. We, we think this is more like living than being uh, being in a nursing home the rest of your life. But that's not really all that life care planning is about. Um, let me start with some beginning things, just because I think it makes sense. One of the things I like about life care planning is this is an area that started out of voc rehab. Uh, the guy, Paul Deutsch, who's credited with sort of kicking this thing off. And he was, credits uh, himself often. Not often. If you ever yes. hear him, my God, that's all he does is talk about how wonderful he is. And he couldn't do it without his airplane. Without his airplane. Yeah. He's got his airplane. Yeah. Although I heard he lost it in the divorce. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway. Oh, darn. We, we had Paul. He was great. Paul did some training that we went to. And he was like, and I've got 6,000 cases of life care plans yeah. on my computer there. And we were like, wow, 6,000. And his computer disappeared before the night was over, I'm sure. It did. Yeah. Uh, actually, after about 300 times of hearing about half 6,000 cases. But you know what? He is the only guy that I, that I know in rehab that was on, that at one time may still be on retainer with one of the largest medical malpractice defense firms. Really? Yeah. And what happened, I think, was he busted them a couple of times. Yeah. And they said, we're going to put him on retainer. So, so they, he we wouldn't don't be on the other side. Yeah. He's, he's a very, very good, uh, yeah. very bright guy, very good witness. Anyway, he went to University of Florida, went to work for, for the Florida VR agency for a while, and um, didn't like it, felt constrained, and so he got out on his own. I don't know how he exactly started. I think he was doing case management. But he got saw the need and got to doing these life care plans and sort of developed the field and mm-hmm. taken off from, from there. We've been going through training on it, and one of the things that I found interesting is that it seems to be taken over by nurses anymore. Yeah. Lots of nurses are doing it. Um, but there are a number of vocational rehab people doing it, and it's kind of an area that we, I think, fit pretty nicely. I think so too. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I understand why nurses are doing the majority of them, but I, I agree yeah. with you that they are. It's well, I, I, there's probably two reasons. That's why. One is very medical. You have to have a pretty strong medical background to, to want to do this, or at least hire into somebody that does. And then, secondly. You got to be a little bit obsessed compulsive, probably, because there's a lot of detail to do with. Well, see, I don't understand why. You know, you're not doing them all now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That sounds exactly like me, doesn't it? Yeah, right. Uh, but it's taken off. They've got a, a an organization now called the uh, International Association of Life Care Planners. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a certification process. Um, you 
pay Paul Deutsch and, and uh, Horace Sawyer at Florida or some other group lots of money, and you go to some training, and uh, eventually you get certified, and you can be a certified life care planner. Haven't you Haven't you been a trainer in that certified? No, I'm going through the certification. Okay. All going right. through it right now. Uh, we've been through about half of it. But you don't have to be certified to actually do life care planning. Oh, no. No, 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 no. That's just... If you were starting out new and didn't know anything about it, this might be a good idea. Yeah. Because they do very good training uh, to get you ready for it. But one of the things that they do, though, is they insist that you have your certification in whatever field you come out of. So if you're a rehab counselor, you've got to be a CRC before you can go for, for their certification. If you're a nurse, you've got to be whatever their certification is. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So what are you doing like your fans? What are you doing like your Uh You've done some. I've done some. I've, I've, I've done a number. I haven't done any in a while because they're extremely time-consuming. They are very time-consuming. And I'm embarking on a new career, you know, with this new name of Sanjaya, you know. Yeah, so right. I don't know if I have time for life care plans anymore. Well, plus I know the way you like to work is you want a lot of money up front with very little time put in. Exactly. 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the problem with life care plans is they do take a lot of time. Mm-hmm. A lot of time. Well, let me tell you what you do in a life care plan. I don't have the official definition with me. You can look it up on the Internet. Um, but basically, you um, determine all the uh, area of care, need, equipment, services, anything that might be needed because of an injury, and you then look at not only how much does it cost for that service or drug or equipment, but how often it's got to be replaced or how often the person has to have it. And you project that over their entire life and show the cycle of, like, for example, a wheelchair. They need a wheelchair. It costs this much for the kind they need. You give it an average lifespan, and then that could be projected out over their life, expected lifespan to come up with the amount of money they need to pay for all this stuff. That's kind of it. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. it. And, but the, but, and, and the reason that we're here instead of in front of Monarch Estates, for example, though, right. at least in my estimation, is that um, the, the question of what somebody needs uh, is driven by, uh, it's a perceptual type thing. Like, where right. do you where you right. come from? So, like, uh, uh, there might be a person who needs a wheelchair, and you'd say, well, they need a wheelchair. That's manual wheelchair costs 500 bucks or something like that. But then somebody else might come along and say, <laughs> <laughs> I said manual. Oh, okay. Then somebody else might come along and say, Oh no no! This person needs uh, the the top of the line, right? All this kind of stuff, and so right. it's, it's it, there's a lot of uh, values issues that you get into with life care plans that right. you don't get into with some of the other work that we do. Absolutely true, because because you, you do the Cadillac plan, do you do what the the patient client consumer right. wants, or do you do the cheapest way? Do you do the defense evaluation, or, <laughs> or, you do or the, the plane of evaluation? <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I mean, it's funny because I guess I've always done the plan of evaluation, so I'm into first first uh, class plans. Which I think, uh, what you, I mean, my own per, my own personal bias about all that is not not necessarily the best. But what you want to look at is uh, the uh, what you want to attend to is what um, restores that person to their functioning before does the best job of restoring them to their level of lifestyle before they got hurt. I mean, that's one right. way of doing it. Right. And so you, you don't want them to lose. I mean, uh, right. if they got hurt and it's no fault of their own, somebody else should pay to keep them at least existing as exactly. well as they had. So you don't want them to lose. You may not want to make millionaires out of them, but you're trying to at least keep them at their old level as yeah. much as you can. Which, much I mean, as you it, can. It, in the case of catastrophically injured paras and quads and people like that, I mean, right. they still don't get those functions back. But you want to get as many things that will allow them to participate fully as fully in life as they did before, right. at least. And I just always go back to, in my mind, the basis of this whole thing is they were cruising along, happy in life, doing whatever. If the injury was not their fault, then whoever's fault it was should pay to get them as close back to that as they can. Right. That, so they deserve that. That's, that. The, that's what drives the whole concept. Right. And, and, it's a, and from a legal standpoint, life care plans fit into that special, like what we've always heard about is, in, you know, in terms of uh, tort reform. Right. That... You can't just sue for a bunch of money anymore. I mean, usually you, you, it, it's helpful to have identified what the costs are associated rather than say, well, you know, how much is is, a, is your paralysis or lack of paralysis worth? Uh, rather than saying that, what we do is we say, okay, it's going to cost $4 million 
to, to bring that person back. I and mean, when you add it all up to as close as possible, and then on top of that, there might be pain and suffering. But this is under special damages, what they call it, I think. Special damages. Yeah. yeah. The pain and suffering part. Right. Exactly. Uh, that That is, in terms of the tort reform, we saw a lot of that where they were going around and saying, well, the, the different uh, legislatures were saying, oh, too much money is being spent, you know, trying to rehabilitate people with disability or suing everybody because they're disabled. So we should cap that or we should somehow contain that. And one of the containment methods has been to make the amount you ask for a, um, what do you call it, based on the real damages. Exactly. Uh, so usually they'll say something like, okay, we'll look at what the real damages are going to cost, and then we'll ask for pain and suffering of, of two and a half times that or two times that or whatever. That's not uncommon. No. That's not uncommon. Yeah. So so that keeps, while that sounds like a lot of money, and, and it is, you might be talking about four or eight million dollars, it keeps it from being these fifty million dollar type of, of settlements. Right. It keeps it out of the sort of outrageous amounts. Well, you you kind of hear what a life care plan, the idea of what it is. Let's talk a little bit about how you actually do one. Uh, first, you have to have a referral, right? That's right. But if you're doing private practice, sooner or later, uh, some attorney is going to think they're saving money by hiring you, who knows, you know, nothing, to to go out <laughs> and do a life care plan. And when they ask you. <laughs> do you know how to do that? You're going to say, well, sure. Or the flip side of that is you're, you'll be involved in the case and you'll say, you know, I could also project the rehab costs and the drugs and the wheel. I can do all that for you, too. And then you'll, you'll, So one of those ways you'll get started. That's right. You'll get a case. So then what do you do? How do you start yours? I, I usually find somebody who knows how to do them, uh, like Cammy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, have, we have a graduate that we mutually hire to help us. Um. I always, I mean, personally, I mean, I, 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 um, I go through some of the same processes that I go when I'm doing vocational evaluations. I mean, I usually, I'll start with the person. I like to interview them. Uh, and, and different from doing vocational evaluations, I really like to interview these people in their homes yeah. and with their families, yeah. at least to start with. I think that's well, it's really hard. Important. It, it's hard to list out all their needs if you don't see the way they live. You exactly. don't see what their house is like. I mean, and that's one of the issues is most people who... Have, and, well, I mean, most of the life care plans I've done, home care modifications has always been an element of That's study. Generally is. And, uh, and so you have to you have to visit them in their home. And I mean, for me personally, one of the questions I have uh, is uh, whether or not a home can be uh, remodeled or refurbished to, to right. fit all the needs that they have or if they're going to have to punt and move somewhere else. And, I mean, all those are, are issues you have to kind of struggle with. Well, it may be cheaper, and I'm going to show you one in just a a minute, but I think it's a good illustration of this. Guy lived on the uh, back, his house backed up to the Chattahoochee River. Way down upon the Chattahoochee, however that (laughs) song went. Anyway, backed up on the Chattahoochee River, and the house is flooded a time or two down in the basement in the bottom part. Well, this guy wants like an elevator to get him up and down from the back of the house, which is not, you know, unreasonable, except it would probably flood every once in a while. I'd have have a new elevator. But anyway, we went we went through uh, astronomical things and money to try to set this house up for this guy who was a quadriplegic and uh, about 400 pounds, which had its own set that's of another, issues. That's, that's another, another issue. But anyway, set all that up, and then what he finally decided was it was cheaper to take that money and buy a new house than to remodel his existing right. house. And, and sometimes I, what I've done, I've looked at people's homes, Especially really older homes, right? And I've I've just said that uh, I didn't think that it was feasible. Uh, and you can have other people come study it. There there are right. rehab professionals that specialize in the rehab engineering or remodeling, architectural re- uh, renovations, right? Uh, and they might say the same thing. But then, uh, because you have to move, you can't make all those decisions, right? I've never been able to. So I've said, well, tell you what, I, uh, I'm going to recommend that you know the average cost for uh, this type of injury is thirty-five thousand dollars, and so I put that into the life care plan and leave the where they're going to move to and all that kind of stuff sort of open. Kind of a moot point. Yeah, it's up to them. You know, a lot of times, what what I'll do is give a, two different scenarios and then let them, you know, cost out two different options and then let either the judge or jury or whoever make the decision. But one thing about that, it ends up almost always being cheaper to send them to a nursing home, which yeah. is why we start off in my yeah. states. It's almost always cheaper, and they, they probably get uh, better care in some ways. But people, particularly young people, 
but most people they don't want to go to a nursing home. They they want right. they were living independently. They don't want all of a sudden be in the structure and routine of a nursing home. And again, to the Monarch States people, if you have to go to a retirement center, that's oh, yeah. a great, oh, it's a fact, great place. That's not has nothing to do yeah. with the quality of. Yeah. In fact, as a matter of fact, the, I've already said the quality of care probably is better than they might get at home. It's better than in, in, at most uh, retirement homes too, from, from my review. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. At, at retirement homes. Yeah. The the uh, I'll give you an example though. I saw a young man up in uh, Memphis who um, got his neck broken with an altercation with the police. And he was living in a little bitty house that they rented for him and had around the clock care. But his physicians wanted to send him to a nursing home. This guy was like 21 years old. And that's the last place he wanted to go. So it's kind of a tough decision what to do. And I had another one about his age up there that um, was living in a nursing home. And we were building all these plans to get him out. But he actually was fairly content. I, he was scared. He was afraid if he got out, he'd die and there would be nobody to help him. Yeah. So he was kind of content to stay there. But, but housing is a big issue with life care plans. Probably the biggest issue that you run into in terms of money and, and uh, the size of the plan has to do with the care they get. Um, if you get somebody out in their house and they need round-the-clock, 24-hour, seven-day-a-week nursing, and if it's at all skilled, even even at a, a LPN level, it's skilled nursing, yeah, that's expensive. Probably, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing math in my head, but it's probably ten to 15000 a month. For round the clock yeah. in home care, I think my last one was a couple hundred thousand a year. Yeah, and you know, you take a young person in their twenties who has a fairly normal lifespan. That's a lot of money, millions and millions, millions and millions. To, so to l- let me ask a question though. It's just uh-huh. just while we're on this, if you were doing a life care plan for a defense firm right. and you had this attendant care built in, right? How would it differ, or would it differ? Yeah. What would you do? Nursing home. <laughs> 3000 a month, we can put them in a nursing home. Three times 12, 36000 a year, hey, we got them covered. Uh, I, I don't know that I would do that or not, but I would say that would be one of the things to look at is, is, is round-the-clock co- uh, care excessive? Is that an excessive call? But, you know, so I, I'd go back to my guy that's over here on the Chattahoochee River. Uh, he's married and has kids, and you might think, okay, well, his wife will do it. Oh yeah, yeah, that's wrong. A good one. Yeah. yeah, that's wrong. Wrong on two bases. Yeah. One is she's not used to doing. My that. wife wouldn't do it. My wife, <laughs> it's day on that day. <laughs> my wife, all I'd hear would be the door closing yeah. and she's headed yeah. out. Kind of reminds me of a eagle song about your lion eyes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway, they'd be out of there, or if not, you can't count on those folks. I mean, number one, they weren't doing that before. They didn't get married to be your caretaker, right? So they don't necessarily want to keep doing that or, or do that. So there's a problem. And the second problem is you don't know if the wife's going to be there or not. And I've seen several cases where the disabled person ended back up on the parents, and the parents didn't want them. I mean, right. not that they, you know, but they didn't want to do all that. They, they, they were looking forward to retirement, not taking care of a disabled person. Or, or son. physically they can't do it. I mean, or physically they can't. It's hard to handle people when you're 65, 70 years old. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think it makes issue. sense to build in care. And the type of care makes sense because it's, you've either got to have skilled or unskilled. It doesn't matter. But you've got to have backup in case a person's sick. They've got to have right. help. But, but I think back on that guy, if he was there by himself and a fire broke out in his house, he'd burn up because he couldn't get out of the bed. Yeah. I mean, he has to have somebody literally get him out of the bed, get his clothes on him, and get him out of the house. So you always think of those kind of things. There's also a, a uh, one of the questions I've had from, on, I've done plaintiff life care plans, and then after I've done the plans, when they were trying to settle it, I would get questions that fall under the category of collateral source, okay. where they would say to me, well, we're trying to settle this case, uh, your plan is $10 million, you know, they, uh, you know, nobody really wants them to spend that much, including the plaintiff. I mean, I'm just saying, this is in the negotiation, yeah. what, what about Medicare, Medicaid, will they cover some of those things, Voc Rehab, will they do some of those? Right. So you get into... That's another element of the life care plan that sort of comes after you do it. Right. But those are the kinds of questions you kind of anticipate coming from the defense side. Right. Right. Why, why won't voc rehab pick this up? Why yeah. won't Medicaid pick this up? And they might, you know, but my job is not to make a legal exactly. determination of whether Medicaid will pick it up or not. It's to say, here are the costs, whoever pays it. And then let the That's lawyers true. argue out who's going to pay the thing. Right. Yes, yeah, that kind of deal. Um, hmm. So, going back to... Two things. One, Paul Deutsch, 
you got this started, you'll see his name in the literature a lot. And if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend this book, uh, Deutsch and Sawyer, A Guide to Rehabilitation. It's from, um, I think it's Ahab Press still. Matthew and Bender. It was, but they changed. Oh, yeah, they sold it out, and I think Ahab Press brought it. You can find it online, did, though. Do you still pay $95 or $115 a year for the update? Yeah, yeah, that's the problem with this book. It's a big old two-volume thing, but it, the, it unclips. You take the cover off, and you can slip other things in there. It's kind of like a binder. Um, but then you pay a hundred and something dollars a year for an update, so it eats you alive over yeah. time. But it's still, even if you just bought it one time, it's a good resource. It's a great resource. So, it and it'll tell you A to Z what to do and how to do it. So that's a good thing. There's another one out by um, Roger Weed over in um, Atlanta on life care planning. He actually has two, but one on general life care planning. Um, I don't find it as useful, but it's a good book too. We but, used it. I have a test item question for you. Okay, I need a what, test what item. Do, what do Roger Reed and um, Paul Deutsch have in common in their practice uh, of rehabilitation other than life care plans? I don't know. They both use an airplane. Do they? Early, yeah. I didn't know that. Roger Reed, when he was in Alaska, that it, it, before going to uh, Georgia State, mm-hmm. uh, his rehab practice, he'd fly all around in Alaska uh, in his little airplane. He has a pilot's license, too. That's so, cool. Yeah. Well, I know we had uh, Paul come down and talk to one of our classes some years ago, and he was on the Firestone case where all those tires blew out, and he was writing yeah. life care plans and all that stuff. Uh, anyway, he had been up in Ohio doing that case, and he, he flew himself back to Auburn and came and talked to our class and flew on down to Orlando. So we were all suitably and notably impressed. I mean, we, we paid homage. You know, they uh, in one of the – it's not a life care plan I did, but it was the uh, one involving uh, Beasley Wilson and um, – that's an attorney firm here. Yeah, in, in Alabama. And then the guy from uh, Butler, from Georgia. They're two, these two guys are like the uh, uh, Clarence Darrow Brown of, of the 21st century now. The heavyweights. The heavyweights. Well, and, and again, this was not my case, but it, it, they, they got a verdict in a um, door latch case. I may have told this story before, but they got a verdict of over $50 million. And the life care plan, which was for a quadriplegic and... Uh, round the clock care, yada yada yada, and it was probably ten million dollars. I think is what the total cost of the life care plan was, and the jury came back with a verdict of more than fifty million. And so, people who are arguing for tort reform say, you know, why? Yeah. Uh, what What's the justification there? Well, why you ask? Yes, why? <laughs> I do ask. <laughs> well, Jerry Beasley in, in his closing argument, and it's one of the brilliant things that he does. Um, at the end of the case, and you have to understand this case took a while and there's a lot of information, but nobody really doubted whether or not it was uh, uh, the automaker's fault. Right. Uh, it really was an issue of how, how damaged was the person. And so what Beasley said was that they had uncovered, and, and they put this into evidence, uh, information from the, the motor company uh, where they discovered that the latches were faulty. Ah, so they knew about it. They knew about it. That's not the only yeah. thing. They sent then all the information they had to an actuary, who is a person who does statistical probability and attaches money to it and all this stuff. And the actuary came back and, he, and said, okay, here's the deal. If you recall all these cars and retrofit them with the right door latch, right. it'll cost you this amount. Right. Let's say it's uh, $200 million. Okay. But if you don't do that, you'll probably lose $100 million in lawsuits. So cheaper. It's cheaper. cheaper to do it's cheaper things. to hurt these, to allow these people to be hurt, even though we know it, than it is to uh, do what I think the jury felt like was the right thing. So Beasley, having submitted all that, and this information is hard to find, I and mean, they had to go to a warehouse under discovery. What the motor companies now do is they give you a key to a warehouse somewhere up north, and you go in, and there's millions, maybe even billions of hmm. uh, documents. And they say it's all in there somewhere. We just haven't cataloged it. Well, Beasley and his guys were, was big enough to bring in a bunch of people, yeah. and they inventoried every piece of paper in there. Wow. And so now, once they go through you know, new lawsuits, they've already got it. And so it ups the ante on some of these cases. But Beasley, in his closing argument, he said, you know, Alabama, Georgia case, he said, you know, uh, let's send a message to Detroit that we're not going to let them keep hurting our people down here that way. Yeah. And so the jury said, we agree. That's kind of like, let's get them Yankees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get them. Let's get them. Yeah, Let's hit them up hard. Yeah. 
<laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean we lost the war? It's still going. That's right. So it's, it's kind of like this. Uh, this yeah. I see so, a Malmute. Yeah. So they got, but they got their uh, big award, right? They did. Yeah. yeah. It, it was not. Uh, uh, it was not reduced or anything like that. It actually, yeah. Ended up they got the, the whole thing. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a pause, and then we'll come back and talk about the uh, more about the procedures of actually doing a lot of different. Not too shabby, huh? Mm -hmm. Sanjaya here. <laughs> Sanjaya's sister here. <laughs> no, no, I passed no Sanjaya way. before you were his sister, believe me. Mike said he liked his setup because it makes him look so much taller than yeah. me. Yeah. Actually, he probably is. Everybody Boy, I'm is. really tall. Yeah, everybody is, so what the heck. <laughs> uh, I want to go back and, and talk a little bit more about process. Um, so we get a referral, we got a life care plan. Let's say it's, a, they, these are all really catastrophic kind of injuries, generally. They have they're, to be, yeah. They're pretty bad off. Um, so we go to their house, we set up for them, go to their house. Don't necessarily need anybody else there. Sometimes they'll have a nurse or somebody already there working with them and right. they'll talk to them. And I always take uh, Cammy with me. So. <laughs> so we set it up so that we'll do a couple things. One is, do basically uh, the kind of interview that I do vocationally, pretty right. much the same interview, social history, educational history, basic facts about where they live and whatever, medical history, vocational, and so forth. Um, anyway, go back and get all that kind of information. But at the same time, something additive is I ask to see all the medication they're on. I ask to look at all the equipment they own, um, medication equipment. I take pictures of the house. Um, you check their bladder bag, all that kind of stuff. I check, see, I ask them about how much of that they use. Well, it's yeah. great because every once in a while a nurse will be there and one of us will talk to the nurse while the other one talks to the uh, consumer. Consumer. Said, right the consumer, right. yeah. The last one that I, the last one I did like that, the, the 400 pound guy, he was in bed. So I was over there talking to him in bed and, and Tammy was talking to the, um, his caretaker and got all that kind of basic information down. What, what, let me say something. The, the comment I made about the bladder bag, the, what we do is uh, you, you really do want to be as detailed as you can be. And so, I mean, when you look at a life care plan, there will be a category for things like catheter tubing, KY jelly, all the kind of stuff that they use, you know, sanitary pads, the, the whole bit. I mean, you want to be as specific as you can because when you, if, if and when you testify in the case, you know, you're, you're sort of being promoted as a person who is... Uh, who has completely captured a day in the life of that person right. and down to the very nitty gritty and what we're talking about is nitty gritty things I mean you have to right. at least address sexual functioning sexual you know, functioning things like that. potential for kids if they want All kids yeah. Uh, yeah. how they do their uh, bladder control their bowel control if they if they have two different they have an indwelling and a condom catheter they use both of those how much do they use each how many bags of those do they use where do they get them from? Who supplies them? Right. Special equipment for recreational activities. Right. Those are, I mean, because you're going to have different kind of wheelchairs for different know, things. Yeah, different exactly. Things. Uh, one of the things that it'll do that's kind of fun is it stretches you as a rehabilitation person because in court, you're, you're the rehab person. So they expect you to know all about the physical rehab and the mental rehab and the vocational rehab, and you're kind of, you're it. You're the that's person right. for that. So it really does force you to have to go learn. Well, what if you don't know about that? You can do two things. You could hire somebody to, to do that part of it or to explain it to you. Or what I like to do, I like to go see the person's PT, OT, speech tip. I like to go yes. visit those people and talk to them about the program. Uh, you can get their records and read it, but it's cool to talk to them. And then you can say, well, how about in the future? What do you think they need? Or what kind of stuff would you say would really help them? And I've had physiatrists talking to them or PTs say, they really need one of these deals that you put the stockings on that shocks their legs and causes them to move their legs and to exercise them, and that's just a healthy thing for them. So I've recommended that kind of a machine just from a PT who said this is something that we think is really good for people with spinal cancer. Plus, uh, Sanjaya Incorporated now has a new program that we uh, allow people to come in in the fall and learn about the recreational activities of uh, uh, paraplegics. And so for a small fee, small you can fee. come into the Early Times uh, Gang, uh, which is now sponsored by Sanjay Incorporated. And you can follow us around as we go to uh, fall recreational activities, insert football games, 
and uh, you learn how to uh, smuggle groundwater at the Jordan Air Stadium, all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, one of the things that has helped me in terms of doing uh, life care plans and uh, generally dealing with you know catastrophic injuries is several having several friends that are in that life position mm-hmm. and just you know sharing time with them. I mean, finding out what it's like oh, to go oh. into restaurants or oh, hotels yeah. or. You know, things like that. The more you know, the easier it is to write them because you yes. just understand better what they're having to go through or, or what they're going to have to go through. Yeah. But absolutely. Um, all right, so we go and interview them. We may spend half a day, three-fourths of a day. We'll spend a good bit of time with the person. Um, I wouldn't cut. I'd always do that. And then after that, then it's a matter of deciding, reading a lot of medical records. And I mean a lot. It comes to me in boxes. Yes. Sometimes I get these big old boxes. Now, actually, the worst is when it doesn't come to you in boxes because you don't get anything. You know, some little, but you need lots of records. Going through those, picking out what's needed, and then, then you assume a sort of case manager role because you might tell the attorney, well, you know, we have got to have some evaluations by these sort of people to tell us what they need in the future. Uh, we need a psychologist or a counselor to look at them. We need a physiatrist to look at whatever it is. Right. And so you may recommend that and they get that done. Once you get all your records read, then you can pretty well start outlining your plan and figure out what you're going to recommend. Then becomes the hard part in my mind. That to me is the easy part. The hard part's writing it. Now the hard part's calling all these places and getting prices. Yeah. You have to have current prices. The recommendation is you have at least two prices and average them from the person's home area. So if you're doing a life care plan for somebody like I was doing in Memphis, you know, you've got to find out how to get to a Memphis directory and start calling everywhere in Memphis. For drug stores and whatever to get get prices. Um, that's the part that just takes forever. But you know, I mean, the, the pharmacological regime is uh, going to be it's going to be ever changing. You would think, I right? Mean, right. So, do you base your projections on what they're taking at the time that you see them, or it depends on what kind of medical support we have. If you got a physician that's somewhere involved in the case, I'll either want to talk to the physician or ask the attorney to ask the physician questions in their deposition, and that's a question yes. I'll ask. I want to ask is they're on this drug now, what's it for, is the dosage, da, da, da. what do you project is their need for that in their future? Right. Now, I keep talking about this Memphis case, just because we have some people in Memphis, but, but that case up there, we couldn't get a position involved. We had a real tough time with it. So I kept telling the attorney, I've written out all the drugs this guy's on, and I projected what it will cost over his lifetime. It was about half a million dollars. I said, I'm not a physician. Well, sure enough, they threw that part of my testimony out. They would not let me testify to that, and they took that out of my life. But that's not your fault. No, I, I mean, that, I, that's, that's I saw all, that coming. That's, that's, that's the lawyer's responsibility yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, to qualify feel, you because yeah. I, I've had similar or a similar scenario, and I've gone with averages. Yeah. With the average uh, of, of given a specific disability type and all that. Right. Now, let me talk about that. Right. I, but it, it does take away from the testimony if you're not as specific as you can be. Right. And you just got to be you have no choice. you, you got to be as specific. Because yeah. there are times, there's the data out of the University of Alabama has a spinal cord injury uh, research unit. It's about the only thing good that's ever come out of the University of Alabama. There, that's okay. true. Yeah. That's true. But it's at Berman. University of Alabama. Oh, yeah. So it's not as bad. But anyway, they put out all kinds of books and figures on the average cost. I don't like to use it. Sometimes I have to use some of that, but I don't like to because I don't want to. Anybody can look at average costs. I want to look right. at what applies to this particular person. It's supposed to be individualized. Well, then after all that, then we put together a life care plan, which is a document, multi-page thing. It's longer than my dissertation. I'm telling you. And much more accurate. Uh, probably. <laughs> and probably a lot more work <laughs> yeah, than it do. It. <laughs> anyway, it consists of a section of narrative where I'm just giving the background on all the stuff that we did. Well, and one of the things that I do is a vocational analysis and projection. A lot of life care yeah. planners don't feel comfortable with that because they're, they're, they've got a medical background. And actually, you and I both do work for some life care planners that we do the vocational part. Exactly. So there's just another whole area. Anyway, what I wanted to show you on this is the typical way this is done is to take each area and put it into a table. And you can see this table. This is projected evaluations, I believe. And then we put down one side... Uh, what the evaluation is, physical therapy, occupational therapy, disabled driver, nutritional analysis, age start, age to finish, cost per time, where uh, we got a vendor that we got our prices from, and then who recommended it. 
we break out the uh, evalu- I break out the evaluations from the routine care because the evaluations cost more. And then it goes on to the next page. Again, it's a table, and this one says um, routine medical care, psychiatric evaluation, recreational therapy, and a rehab case manager. Now, now let me ask you a question that I'm sure students are thinking right now that's just burning in their mind. All right. Did you did you form did you make those tables yourself? I did actually. But if you didn't want to do all that, could you buy software that would oh, help you? Oh, yeah. It? There's a, a in the Life Care Planning Association to help you out there. Group. Uh, there's two different companies, one out of Huntsville, as a matter of fact, two different companies that have the tables already kind of pre-done and you fill them in yeah. uh, and put in the prices and all that kind of stuff. So you can buy software to do that. You know, these are just basically um, uh, tables in, in a Word document. So we did that. They look good. You didn't do good. Uh, they came out okay. Uh, so I got projected therapeutic modalities, medication. Well, see, it looks like you must have probably a thousand dollars worth of work in there. <laughs> Actually, this one was about twelve thousand dollars. The last one that I did before this was eighteen thousand dollars. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when you get sweat and bullets. <laughs> you will get paid. No, that's when you get the retainer. Uh, that's when you keep asking past the retainer. Yeah, yeah. This one has fourteen tables. The last one is home modification. Uh, transportation is one. Home care, home or facility care, orthotics, wheelchair needs. This is on the big guy that's a quadruple. Anyway, the tables is where the action is on here because that forms the basis of um, the cost, and then those tables are given to an economist to project out and determine how much the whole thing's worth. And in this case, it was worth up around eight, eight million, I believe, something yeah. like that. And you know, the, there's a couple of things that. If you really, if you get into doing life care plans and you're doing a lot of them, you're going to want to associate yourself with uh, a physical uh, medicine, I mean, a, a, a rehabilitation physician yeah. of some kind, a yeah. physiatrist, Absolutely. or somebody like that. Because if you can't get a treating physician or right. somebody like that to, to sign off on some of this stuff, at least you've got a physician and say, well, I consulted with them. Maybe right. that person be deposed as well. Right. But uh, it helps with that to get that kind of information. I've got a guy like that that we met in a life care planning training that I went through um, from Pennsylvania, and he, he he farms himself out to do that. And he he actually will come down and see the person, and then he'll make the physical medicine recommendations and sort of takes you off the hook on that. Um, my background is as an occupational therapist, so I'm comfortable with a lot of those. But there's other things I'm not comfortable with. So having a guy like that in the background is fabulous. And I would say that a life care plan, at least in my uh, work with it, the, the communication between the planner, meaning you or me or Dr. McDaniel, the, the planner really needs to communicate with the attorney throughout the whole process so that, like you said earlier, if he's going to, he, and you need to know that he's going to go take the deposition of Dr. Hood, you know, or right. somebody like that. Right. And, and you say, these are the questions I need you to ask him. Right. Does he need that? I mean, and get him to be as specific as possible right. and then... You know, at the end, we say, okay, and also, in your experience with him, has the patient been a cooperative patient, you know, that kind of stuff for character if you're on that side of the fence? Mm-hmm. And sometimes getting them to do that. And, or or if it comes toward the, if you've already done your life care plan, uh, you would ha- maybe ask the attorney to give a copy of it to the physician ahead of time. And at the end of the deposition, say, if, if you look at the life care plan, he goes, yes, do you agree with it? And he says, yes. Well, you, oh, that's you, really solid. <laughs> you got that's it made solid. then. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've tried to do a couple times, uh, we have a really good physiatrist, uh, physician of physical medicine and rehabilitation up at University of Alabama, Birmingham, that sees spinal cord injury. That's her specialty. And there's several times I've sent my completed life care plans to her, and I said, would you look this over? We'll pay you. Mm-hmm. But would you look this over and make remarks or suggestions or whatever? She won't do it. But it's always good. When they ask me, I'll say, yeah, because she'd be the one that'd be the, the treating physician for this particular case. I said, I sent it to his treating physician to look at. Now, oh, yeah. The fact that she didn't respond to me. Not your fault. It's not my fault, yeah. but at least I've made that effort. It makes me look like I'm trying to be as objective as I can. Yeah. That's what a professional would do. Yeah. 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 Do that sort of thing. Um, the physician thing is real tricky, though, because sometimes these people will get hurt. They go to the emergency room. They go to a you know, in, in hospital, they go to a GP or somebody who doesn't really know a whole lot about this area and they need to see a specialist. 
because there's so much, I'm thinking spinal cord injury again, mm-hmm. there's so much that can um, happen later in life with them that would require a spine stimulator or a spine pump to, for drugs to stop uh, things like shaking in the legs. Medical. Gym, they thought Jimmy Leg or something like that. I think it's a nice medical. Thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we got off into one case the whole reproductive thing. Well, I don't know anything about that, but we were able to talk to reproductive medicine place, and they told us all we needed to know. Expensive for spinal cord right. injury was, I think it was about twelve thousand dollars to harvest the sperm for one shot, and then it was another five or six thousand. I mean, it ended up being about twenty thousand per try to fertilize an egg. Wow. Um, and that didn't mean it was going to happen. That was for a try. So, anyway, we learned more about um, that kind of thing than we probably wanted to know. But it was very, it's, it's a very interesting thing to learn. So, in this area, you end up doing a lot of research. You'll learn a good bit if you do a lot of research. And, and really, a life care plan is a, is a kind of an extrapolation of an individualized written rehabilitation plan. Very if you did so. that for a, for the span of somebody's lifetime. Yeah, that's a good way to look yeah. at it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's how Deutsch got started doing it, as, as, as you said. As you said, yeah. Well, I don't know. That probably is all I know. <laughs> that's probably more than I know about life care plans. I don't know. Well, there's a lot to know. I mean, even in the case of spinal cord injury, you're going to have people who also have a brain injury. Right. You know, because of, uh, of that. So you're looking, at, uh, you're looking at the whole person no matter what. Probably more so than in, in almost any other area that we delve into because a lot of times in other areas like vocational evaluations we, we're sort of limited to the injury in question right uh in this case we have to look at them as a whole person we really do yeah you have to look at everything because you yeah. again you you're the rehab expert when you go to court they don't have other people going to talk about these things you've got to talk about and, and i have had uh lawyers who are opposing the life care plan ask me from the witness stand uh well uh you have in your life care plan that you think that my client should pay for this. And my response to that is, no, no, no. I, I, I don't care what your client pays for or not. I mean, yeah. none of those things are my concern. These are just what they cost. Right. And so you stay out of the, the bias. I mean, when, in, in terms of your testimony. Yeah. You stay out yeah. of appearing to be biased. You're just giving it a call. They need it. This is what it costs. You're not concerned who pays yeah. for it. You're only concerned with what they need and what it costs. That's really a liability issue or a totally different issue there to get all together. Two things I've seen on people defending life care plans on the insurance side. One is when they get into court, now not before then, but when they get in front of a jury, they don't want to be seen as that cheap attorney who right. nickel and dime this poor, disabled person. You know what I'm saying? Right. And they set it up like that. So, so they'll be very nice to you in court. They don't want to nickel and dime you too badly um, unless they can figure a way to get you to a, that, to say there's a lot cheaper way to do it. And speaking of cheap ways to do it, and I, I've, I've talked to uh, Dr. McDaniel about assigning this to y'all. You need to, uh, there's a, a really heady uh, review of that issue on Seinfeld where, <laughs> where uh, I missed uh, it. Uh, I think it was George. Uh, Somehow they, they, they destroyed some lady's wheelchair, and so they decided to replace the wheelchair, and they end up going to Goodwill. No offense to Goodwill people, but they got her a Goodwill wheelchair because it was cheaper. And yeah. She ends up going down a hill, and the wheel falls off and all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> in fact, you could show that in court, and it would make your point. <laughs> hey, yeah, you, know, you yeah. could run a little sign fill. That would be interesting. Yeah. Well, one thing is that they probably are not going to nickel and dime you too bad. But the other thing is, and this is, just, this is where they'll try to get you, I've had them. Uh, <laughs> I've had them. Hire life care planners on their side to critique your life care plan. I've done and, a lot of that. And the last one that was hired was a, a physician out of Chicago. And first they sent his resume. He had an 80-page resume. The guy had about 25 pages of publications. He was a pianist, a concert pianist, and he had tons of newspaper articles. But I just think went on and on and on and on and on. So we were we were laughing harder about the resume than we were about the guy. Because I thought, oh, this guy who's a physician will give me a hard time on the medical part. But it turned out they settled it, so yeah. he didn't get involved. Uh, typically, though, if you're hired on the defense side to do on life care planning, you don't actually do a life care planning. You probably never actually meet with the uh, uh, injured party. You probably instead review McClanahan, Dr. McClanahan's life care plan, and look at ways to critique it or ways you think that he was excessive. And sort of pick at him, nitpick at him. And they'll nitpick at him if you give them the information in the deposition 
and try to get him to change some of it. But most of them are not going to do a lot of that in front of the jury. Yeah, you'll get you'll get attacked a lot more in depositions in depos- on this. than you will than you will yeah. uh, from this, the witness stand. Yeah. Which is funny because this is just the opposite of other cases where they're nice as pie to you is in the deposition, right. but uh, but when you get in front of the stand, they chew you up. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, the thing about that though is that regardless, they're probably going to send you a subpoena. I mean, you're probably going to get subpoenaed to have to appear. That's right. That's subpoena. Has that happened to you? I think I have gotten a subpoena hey. fairly recently. Recently? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this goes back to our um, earlier discussion about subpoenas. And this is sort of, this is not necessarily, this is not germane only to life care plans, but all of our work. So I have this, uh, I have this subpoena. we are showing life care plans. So subpoena looks like this. I'm getting all the confidential stuff out there, you know. That's page one. Here's page two. And for some reason, people in the in the law profession... Oh, no, wait. Yeah, here's page three. Page three. Now, unless you're a speed reader or so whatever. This, this is the subpoena, and my guess is it's going to tell you in those three pages what they want. They want you to appear and bring some things. Yeah, this That's is notice head. of deposition. Oh, okay. Right. All right, subpoena for deposition. So they say bring these things. There are there are seventeen um, numbers on here, and number one, for example, goes A through G. And let, let me just let me just say, uh, here are some of the things they want: a true and correct copy of the entire and complete file of deponent. That in this case would be me. Compiled in connection with this case, including but not limited to the following: any and all telephone logs. Evidence in conversations relative to any aspect of this lawsuit. All notes, memoranda, blah, 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 in connection with the lawsuit. All photographs taken. All diagrams or drawings. All billing statements. All correspondence. All reports. Now, now it goes on number two. And this is where it starts. Number one's okay. I always try to give them number one. Number two. All standards and literature of any type including but not limited to literature literature in the form of uh, treatises, journals, books, pamphlets, periodicals, publications, studies, or any other document of any type or description referred to by the aforesaid expert in connection with this lawsuit. Your library. That's your library. And which has any very indirect, I think it should be directly, but anyway, Uh only opinions, that will be rendered by the department. Earlier in uh, in the uh, podcast, I mentioned that uh, a lot of uh, uh, subpoenas I don't respond to. Right. Now, now the way this will go, and I have not, this is actually a uh, deposition scheduled for two weeks from now, but the way this will go, and it goes on and on, it, 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 they want me to bring my mother, my <laughs> brother, father, your birth certificate, birth certificate, <laughs> everything else, uh, but, but truthfully what it is, what it is, I'll show up with my file uh, and maybe billing transmittals and that'll be fine. Yeah. And, and it, um, it, um, so they're using a standard form there. It's a boilerplate. Yeah. Boilerplate that they send to everybody. Uh, and you know, when you when they ask you to bring all of your uh, treatises and all that, you really are. It's a, it's a whole library and then computer programs, all that kind of stuff. And, and actually, as a matter of law, they're not entitled to all that. Yeah. But they ask for everything. Yeah. And they don't. Yeah. It doesn't really bother them how hard you. Unless, why unless you, you can uh, get them to charge you for it. Why don't you do the, uh, it's all there in my house somewhere. Just yeah. uh, come over, send somebody <laughs> no, over. I'm going to tell them it's your house. <laughs> in my house. It probably is. I probably have all his stuff at my house, but finding it's a different issue. I wonder why we're getting this. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's slowing down on us. Yeah, sure is. All right, Mike. I think it must be time the computer's dying. Yeah, so I think it's time to give it, give it a bit. Oh, here. Oh, it's like Tommy. It is Tommy. Is that Tommy? Yeah. Oh, he really appreciates y'all uh, listening in. We'll see you next time. We're going to be talking about dealing with the economy. San Jaya, signing off. So get ready to take some notes. What we say ain't always true. We'll come test the time it all falls on. Come test time, it all falls on you We just toss out a lot of crap To 
see how well you'll do. Oh, we say all kinds of grand things that don't make them true. Come test time it all.